right, everybody. Thank you for joining me once again. We're, we're dealing with people who are wrong on the interwebs. Um, it doesn't look like slowing down anytime soon. There certainly is a vast, enormous, unending cesspit of disinformation, misinformation, ideology, spin doctory available on the interwebs. This is a repeat offender, a recidivist that I've dealt with on this channel before, and I'll deal with him again here because, frankly, I find his um, statements that he makes publicly to be hugely damaging to the public good, incredibly injurious, very, very dangerous, um, partial information, disinformation, contextually incorrect information, conceptually incorrect information, that could well lead a person to make very, very bad choices for their long-term health. And as such, I think it's irresponsible and needs to be dealt with. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, Christopher Gardner, again, He's talking about so-called insulin resistance. So let's hear what he has to say and put him right where he's wrong. And guess what? Spoiler. Mm, that'll be everywhere just about. Oh yeah, Christopher, off you go. One of the most important factors in a healthy metabolism is glucose homeostasis. Sure. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced or heard of having too low of a glucose or hypoglycemia. So that's going to be hunger or shakiness or sweating. And the opposite side of that is too much glucose in your blood, hyperglycemia. So that's going to be thirst or fatigue or blurred vision. These are all things you want to avoid. Insulin is one of the key hormones responsible for maintaining glucose homeostasis. Yes. Let's take a look at how this happens in the body. Insulin is made by the pancreas and is secreted into the blood. Okay, so what is it, Christopher, that causes the pancreas to secrete insulin? What is the trigger for that production of insulin? Well, the single most powerful trigger for the release of insulin is the appearance in the bloodstream of exogenous carbohydrate. There are other things that will cause insulin to increase slightly as well, but nowhere near what, what carbohydrate will do. For example, there are one or two um, insulinogenic amino acids, for example, but vastly, hugely, overpoweringly, the stimulus for Insulin production is carbohydrate appearance in the blood. Fine. When glucose appears after eating a typical meal. For most cells in the body, insulin is like a key that is needed to open a door in the cell that allows glucose to be taken up into the cell and removed from the blood. So a couple of things there that are being implied without a, a statement to the contrary being made very clear by Christopher Gardner here. The removal of the glucose from the blood is being touted by Christopher there as a good thing. Oh, thank goodness, we've removed that glucose from the blood. Well, sure, that is a great thing for the cells. If those cells require glucose for energy at that time. Here's the thing about glucose. At anything above the physiologically required level, even a very tiny amount above that, Glucose immediately becomes hugely, enormously toxic to cells. As such, if a cell is replete with energy and requires no glucose for energy at this time, because its energetic requirements are subserved already, thank you very much, then absorbing glucose from the blood according to the concentration gradients between the blood and the cell would not be productive or a good thing. That would be hugely, enormously, immediately damaging to those cells. As such, there is a mechanism inside these cells that, for want of a better term, locks that door from the inside, meaning that insulin will not bind to that receptor. 
that door will not be opened and yet more glucose will not be allowed to pour into that cell thus causing it to undergo and sustain damage and possible cell death as a result of that. So the sacrificial lamb becomes the epithelial cells and the red blood cells in the vascular tree. As such, those cells are much less complex than, say, very important cells like heart cells, muscle cells, etc. And those cells are protected at the expense of the blood being kept in a pool in the blood. So too much glucose in the blood, so those cells become damaged. They can be replaced much more rapidly much more easily than the more complex, more important cells. And as such, that's what the evolution is. Of course, as we evolved as a species, the number of times that our blood glucose was spiked because of exogenous carbohydrate intake was extremely rare, extremely rare indeed. Carbohydrates just simply weren't available to us as a food source. We are not evolved for the intake of, of, of exogenous carbohydrates at all. In fact, gluconeogenesis, its mere existence as a metabolic pathway and as a, a mechanism to produce glucose from non-glucose precursor in the exact amount required, by the way, that in and of itself is yet another very, very powerful indication that the exact amount of glucose that should be ingested, either in the form of glucose directly or in the form of carbohydrates that release glucose, should be kept as close to zero as is feasible. The exact requirement for carbohydrates nutrition-wise for human beings is none, not one single gram ever. This is the reason why. Every time you eat exogenous carbohydrates, that will spike your blood glucose, and that is contraindicated. Absolutely contraindicated. Okay. By the way, the mechanism which locks the door from the inside that I referred to is, um, is one of the activities of a thing called the Randall cycle, which people can make themselves much more au fait with if they study my videos on my channel with regard to it, the Randall cycle. There's a playlist and everything that covers it. Uh, I'm also, I have also already recorded a instructional lecture style video about 45 minutes long for Judy Cho and that will be appearing on her low carbohydrate symposium in around about May of 2023. People could uh, keep an eye out for that one as well. Um, that's the most up-to-date presentation I've made on the topic. You need to go and learn it because that's the thing that's at play here and it exists precisely because it is supposed to. It exists in order to protect the cells from glucose damage. Okay, it's not a condition, it's not a pathology, it's not a complaint, it's not a disease, it's not the cause of any disease. It is a normal, natural, indicated, utilitarian, biological process encoded for in the human system by the very DNA that makes you human. Okay, the disease process, the pathology is elevated blood glucose. That is what needs dealing with. The way to deal with it is to stop pouring carbohydrates down your ignorant neck. All carbohydrates. And that includes fructose as well, which I'll get to in a minute. All right, Christopher, make some progress. At that point, the glucose might be used by the cell for immediate energy needs or stored as glycogen. For later energy needs. Right, so if the cell is not needing to make a lot of energy right now, ATP immediately, and it has a full storage capacity for glycogen, then it needs no further carbohydrate and, and allowing carbohydrate in high concentration in the blood to force its way into that cell on the basis of that concentration gradient under the influence of insulin is not indicated. It's a bad thing, it's a bad idea, we do not want that to be occurring. As such, the door is locked from the inside and the insulin will not open the door. It won't bind to the receptor. Okay? Because that's what's supposed to happen. Not a disease, not a condition, not a complaint, not a pathology. Nothing is wrong. That is the normal process. That is your body protecting itself from damage. Great. Fine. Solution, stop 
pouring carbohydrates down your neck. Simple, easy, one step. What's next? Insulin also has an interesting role related to the storage of fat in fat cells. Typically, the body uses combinations of glucose and fat for energy needs. Energy needs are typically low when we are eating a meal. Hopefully, you're sitting and relaxed while eating, and you're not up and running about. So when glucose is being absorbed and insulin is being released, one of the messages this hormone has for fat cells is, hey fat cells, save your stored fat. No reason to release that now. We just ate plenty of available glucose around to meet our minimal energy needs at the moment. Save the fat for energy needs later. Well, sure, but not really relevant to this discussion. For people with a healthy metabolism that's sensitive to insulin, this all works well. Now, the healthy metabolism is the one possessed by the person who's feeding themselves appropriately according to their speciation, their genetic gift. Um, the person who's eating a diet consistent with their evolutionary past. And that is a diet containing close to, if not actually, no exogenous carbohydrates at all, Christopher. None. Okay? Well, but for some people, particularly those who are overweight and possibly pre-diabetic... Yeah, and what was the cause of that? Exogenous carbohydrates being poured down that person's neck. A condition referred to as insulin resistance. No, insulin resistance is a construct, and the use of the terminology to label a so called pathology is also a construct, and it is demonstrably false, as I have already made very clear, I think, in this video. It is not a pathology, it is not a condition, it is a normal part of the physiological functioning of a human being. The pathology in the person who is overweight and or pre-diabetic and or diabetic, the problem there is elevated blood glucose. Okay, that is the thing that needs ameliorating. We don't do that by trying to counteract the cells doing exactly what they should do. We counteract it by stopping the overload into the blood of exogenous carbohydrate, which is contraindicated, dangerous, damaging, Life shortening, health span destroying, that is the solution. Okay? It occurs. This can have an impact on both glucose and fat regulation. For the glucose, what this can mean is that insulin has become inefficient at telling cells to open the door to let the glucose in. Again, based on the construct, the idea that those cells should always respond to insulin because it's there, and that the indication is that it's a good thing to get the blood out of, to get the glucose out of the blood and into the cells. Well, no. The cells are blocking the glucose for a reason to protect themselves. What is occurring with this so called insulin resistance is exactly what should. When glucose levels stay elevated in the blood, the pancreas... Well, what causes that, Christopher? Oh, I know. The, continue, the continuation of the habit of pouring carbohydrates down one's neck. Any form of carbohydrates. There are no good ones and bad ones, clean ones and dirty ones. All carbohydrates break down to the same thing, with the exception of fructose. And that thing is glucose. All carbohydrates. Okay. Fructose is a different story. Fructose is handled almost entirely by the liver through a different pathway leading to the immediate production of triacylglyceride, which we'll get to when Christopher talks about that in a minute. Okay. Fructose is also seven to ten times more damaging to the human tissues as is glucose. Fructose is vastly, hugely, immediately toxic. Vastly more than glucose, even. Okay, so the answer here remains the same no carbohydrates in the diet to speak of at all. Okay, Chris senses this and it makes more insulin at least well, only if you continue to pour carbohydrates down your neck. Stop doing that. The overload of glucose entering the bloodstream ceases, as does the production of insulin. Problem solved. Jobs are good in.
Still a one-step solution. Stop eating carbohydrates. At least initially, the extra insulin will then be enough to convince the cells to let glucose in. And thus endure damage. Contraindicated. Bad idea. But as the situation continues, it may require more and more and more insulin. Or you could stop pouring carbohydrates down your neck and the problem is solved. And then that insulin buildup doesn't occur. This isn't rocket science, Christopher. This is straightforward common sense. Once you understand basic concepts, first principles of human physiology, biochemistry, energetics, nutrition, you are supposed to be a professor in this field. Well, you are a professor in this field. You have been granted that. For what reason, I have no idea, frankly. That's for another day, though. To get the same amount of glucose into the cells. Glucose concentrations in the blood may look normal, but this comes as a result of having elevated insulin in the blood, and that insulin has other effects. So with insulin resistance... Uh, only if you pour carbohydrates down your neck and thus require the body to continually produce more and more and more glucose. Stop doing that. Problem solved. The fat cells don't get the message to keep storing their fat when there's insulin in the blood. And this is particularly true for visceral fat. That's the fat that surrounds the organs in the belly area. The insulin may be trying to encourage the fat cell to keep storing fat, but it's as if the fat cell responds by saying, what? What was that? I oh man, Dave's not here. Dave's not here, man. I can't hear you. It's someone's- We got the stuff. We've got the stuff. Oh man, Dave's not here. Say more fat was needed. Okay, releasing more fat now. And that fat leaves the fat cell, circulates in the blood looking for a muscle cell that might need energy. Well, it's not doing any such thing, actually. But it was a mistake. There weren't any muscles looking for fat energy. The fat circulates in the blood for a while, but when none of the cells take it up, the liver eventually takes it out of the blood. And the liver then packages the fat up in a lipoprotein particle and sends it back to be stored in the fat cell where that fat cell might take it up, but then release it again, by mistake, mm -hmm. again. Sure. And if the muscle cells don't need it, the liver picks it up again and sends it back. Can you sure, but so what? You see the vicious circle going on here? Yeah, but so what? This can lead to hypertriglyceridemia. Yes, as can consuming fructose, for the reason I've already outlined, Christopher. So when you have a patient who presents with hypertriglyceridemia, what's the cause? Is it insulin being too high because of too much carbohydrate consumption? Or is it directly causal as an artifact of the metabolic pathway of fructose, which leads directly to hepatic production of triacylglycerides? And how do you know which it is? Hmm. Tell you what, stop pouring carbohydrates down the person's neck. That stops the first mechanism from occurring in the first place. Include fruits, including fructose and anything containing high fructose, corn syrup and any of that kind of stuff out of there as well. That takes care of the second mechanism. I think we're done. But your advice is not going to reflect that very simple, unassailable, unequivocal set of facts that I've just provided for people, Christopher, is it? Because you have a different ideology about nutrition, don't you? One that's not based in science or common sense. One that's based in theology. Mm. Let's hear it. High triglyceride levels in the blood. This is one of the classic indicators of insulin resistance. Or indeed fructose intake. For clinicians, it's good to check up on glucose for your patients, but... The sure, but it's not going to be necessary for 99.9% .9 of people who don't consume exogenous carbohydrate because gluconeogenesis will maintain their blood glucose at exactly the correct level for that person at that time. That's how it works, Christopher, pretty much. The only time you're going to find someone who eats a diet, as I've described just now, that has an elevated level of blood glucose or an elevated A1C to any level, is going to be someone who is consuming proportionately too much protein for their requirements and not enough fat, or indeed too much massive food altogether. Those are easy fixes. 
for someone who wants to consult with someone actually competent, such as myself. You can do that by clicking the bit.ly link underneath this video and selecting go to Patreon for membership to consultancy tiers. Okay. There's more to it than that. For those who might have prediabetes. Well, what's prediabetes? Because at the end of the day, diabetes is elevated blood glucose and nothing else. That's how it's diagnosed. That's what it is. That's what the pathology is. That's what needs dealing with. And the means of doing that is to stop eating carbohydrates, period. End of. Simple. Um, so what's prediabetes? I mean, either the person's blood glucose is elevated above normal or it's not. It's just a threshold decision about categorizing people for diagnoses as being, well, you're not having super high blood glucose, but it's above the mean value, so that could be a problem in the future. Well, that's a problem now. It's actually still diabetes. Because diabetes is elevated blood glucose chronically. Okay? Or be headed to type 2 diabetes or have metabolic syndrome. Enough metabolic syndrome is also a construct. What company has developed and built and markets an, a metabolic um, syndrome meter, Christopher? What physiological thing is that based on? It isn't. It's a composite measure put together as a construct, as an idea, by people with very poor levels of education on this topic. Okay? In the same way that insulin resistance, so called, is a construct, so too is metabolic syndrome. Okay? The problem is exogenous carbohydrate consumption. The solution is stop it. What's next? Another way to monitor this is to be checking up on insulin levels or triglyceride levels. Sure. Also, you could just do what's required, and that is to stop consuming carbohydrates. So for this insulin resistance situation, you can be catching that early on before this heads into type 2 diabetes. And from a dietary perspective, this is pretty straightforward. This just means being extra vigilant mm -hmm. about added sugars. Well, Christopher, we've covered this. All carbohydrates except fructose break down to exactly the same thing, that being glucose. You're going to say, I imagine that, oh yes, but the GI scale tells us how quickly that occurs and how serious the spike will be based on what kind of carbohydrates and in what form they are consumed, to which the response is scientifically, Christopher, nonsense. The signal-to-noise ratio on the GI scale calculations published tell us that the GI scale has a utility of exactly zero in predicting what an individual person's response will be to any glucose bolus or the differential between different glucose boluses between a given individual or indeed within different individuals. There is nothing to see in there. All carbohydrates break down to glucose. That's all we know about it. That is contraindicated. That should cease. That means all carbohydrates should be withdrawn from the diet. Simple. That is the pragmatic, scientifically sensible, indicated course of advice. You're telling people to eat carbohydrates. That is false advice. That is misanthropy. That is nonsense of the highest order. And it's as ignorant as it's possible to be. Incredible. And refined grains, getting those out of the diet. No, getting all carbohydrates out of the diet is the, is the solution. All of them. Those are the things that spike the glucose. Yes. And so are the things that are not refined sometimes too. As I said, the GI scale will not predict this. And spike the insulin, and that leads to the insulin resistance. So No, not at all. The thing leading to the so-called insulin resistance is the fact that the cells are complete and replete with energy and they require no more. Thus, the door is locked to glucose. Thus, the liver thinks that its production of insulin has been insufficient because it's still sensing elevated blood glucose because you're still pouring it down your neck like an idiot. And so it continually produces more and more insulin. That is the problem. It is the exogenous glucose consumption in any form. So stop it. What's next? Oh, you want to be replacing those with a combination of whole grains? No, you don't want to be doing any such thing because they're carbohydrates too, Christopher, and they break down to the same thing. Glucose. Plus, they have added 
um, insoluble fiber, which is also contraindicated for human functioning, health, etc. Fiber has been covered by other commentators as well as myself in great detail in many, many fine, actually science-based and educational videos. I would look up Dr. Paul Mason and fiber as your search terms on YouTube and you'll find the video which covers this one off, I think, more than eloquently. I don't need to cover that again. So no, you do not want to be eating whole grains. Vegetables? No, you don't want to be eating vegetables. They're full of toxins that will destroy your systemic function, cause inflammatory process, the very thing we're trying to avoid. They provide also contraindicated and damaging fiber, which has been covered by Dr. Paul Mason, as I said. No, there is no place for vegetables, fruits, whole grains, any carbohydrates, any plant material of any kind to speak of in the human diet. Actually, Christopher, you are mistaken, sadly mistaken. And beans on the one hand, those no, are... No beans. Look up lectins. <laughs> wow. They're good quality carbohydrates. No, there are no good quality carbohydrates. The exact requirement for carbohydrates in the human diet is not one single gram ever, Christopher, of any form at all instead of low quality carbohydrates and on the other side you could substitute those refined grains and added sugars with avocados nuts and seeds fatty fish uh, lectins mercury toxicity potentially from some of those things that you just spoke about copper toxicity is an issue there and as well potentially all sorts of problems with that the human diet should be based on the red meat, muscle meat only, and not organs, muscle meat and associated fat, large ruminant animals, mostly. Okay? That's how to maximize the likelihood of health, robustitude, experience of life in general, and, and probably longevity, it seems. That's what's actually underpinned by actual common sense uh, interpretation of what the so-called science actually tells us. And what you've just heard from Christopher Garden here is entirely incompetent, entirely false, demonstrably false, and dangerous. Uh, good olive oil on a salad. Olive oil, good, no, no. Olive oil is 14 to 16% polyunsaturates, which tend to have a pro-inflammatory effect offset somewhat by the anti-inflammatory effect of the monounsaturates in the olive oil, but not sufficiently, it seems. Also, uh, oils of that kind tend to suffer rancidity issues, even if kept under quite good conditions, frankly. Most of that rancidity actually occurs during the manufacture of those oil products, Christopher. Okay. Salad, so... Salad, no salad, leafy greens, oxalate, fiber, all sorts of other things, depending on what you put in your salad, maybe deadly nightshades while you're there, um, add some beans for some lectins, add some nuts for even more lectins, inane. Those would be high-fat substitutions for the low-fat carbohydrates. If you want a high-fat, why don't you eat animal fat that comes with the meat that you should be eating, the muscle meat of large ruminant animals, Christopher, as per your genetic gift, as per how we've evolved as a species for at least 350,000 years and more like probably four and a half million. That's what the actual science tells us, the anthropology on it. That's what human beings have eaten. That's how we are evolved. That's what they positive and negative selection pressures have been. That's why that works so well for people, Christopher, and not the consumption of plants, which is ultimately destructive. No two ways about it. Great. Those would be your strategies for- No, they wouldn't. Well, they would be your strategies if you're a fool. If you want to die sooner than you otherwise would, most likely. If you want to destroy your metabolism with toxins, including carbohydrates, Fiber, oxalate, tannic acids, deadly nightshades, lectins, all sorts. Or you could just eat meat and animal fat, muscle meat and animal fat. Salt, butter, water, rest and repeat. 
Try that. That'll, that'll sort your so-called insulin resistance out rapidly. That, and let's get back to the initial argument, which still holds. Insulin resistance is not a pathology, is not a condition, is not a complaint, and does not need reversing. What needs reversing is your inappropriate dietary habits. Okay? It's been my pleasure. Um, Christopher is summing up clearly, so we don't really need to hear that necessarily. We've heard everything of substance that he's had to say. It's all been false, ignorant, and wrong. Um, sorry to have to report that to you. I take no pleasure in it. It's my responsibility as a responsible, duly qualified, and sensible educator. My pleasure. Hope you got something from it. Join me next time when someone else will be wrong on the interwebs. Ciao for now.